What's cracking, big dogs? Back at you again this week with the feature film. We got The Godfather back on the pod. Uh, you know, missed his presence last week. Probably one of the best episodes we've ever done, if I'm being honest. <laughs> but we got, we got him back yeah. this week. And we're going to run, uh, you know, this show a little bit differently. But uh, before we get into it, Noah, man, you know what time it is, baby. Already? You want me to hit the intro? Wow, it was a quick, doesn't even welcome us in. We don't That's even get to say hi or nothing. That's crazy, because he kept going, I was going to hit it regardless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to, trying to time back. I was trying to catch him off guard. All right, so. All right, yeah, let's hit we, that we intro. Normally- We normally do a uh, weekly recap and, you know, I think this week we're going to approach it a little bit differently, uh, mainly because, you know, we're a good chunk in the season, man. Honestly, we've lasted longer than I thought we would last. Uh, so uh, we're like, said. you know, we're seven games in. Uh, some some teams have had a buy earlier than expected, but, you know, you're almost halfway through your fantasy season. Right halfway right? So, through the regular season, yeah. Yeah, we're halfway through the regular season. So it's time to take a look back, and we're going to try and do a redraft of the first two rounds of a super flex rookie draft, assuming we know what we know now. And it's pretty interesting. I mean, we were we were going through this today, um, and we are kind of going back and forth and just doing the picks, and it's crazy, man. It, it's honestly crazy. Like, it goes to show, like, none of us know anything. Not me, not Nick, not Noah, not fucking Matthew Barry, not anyone. We don't know anything. But what we do know – is it's going to be incredibly different, but it's going to be interesting to go through these. And, you know, some of us, you know, sometimes we'll be probably pretty similar between all three of us, and then sometimes we'll probably deviate a little bit. So we'll kind of get into that. Um, but without further ado, let's, uh, let's get into this little, little business right here. Um, so I got your boy, got the pick, 101. Got blessed uh, by the godfather here. And I like nothing- this. Keep, you keep you keep calling me the Godfather. You keep that going. I like I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. So we're gonna keep going with it. But I got the 101, and nothing's really changed for me here. And maybe this comes as a shock to others, but I'm still going with my boy Jonathan Taylor at the 101 overall. Uh, you know, granted the QBs have been balling. Joe Burrow looks great, and we'll go get into the couple of the other ones later. But for me. You know, Jonathan Taylor has been disappointing. So I think this might be a little bit shock for people to see him down here. I don't know if you guys would have picked Jonathan Taylor, but I still really, really value workhorse running backs. And to be quite frank, he's disappointed for the earlier part of the season. But over the last couple of weeks, he's gotten a little bit better for me. And the workload is secure. Um, the, the coaches clearly do believe in him and still want to use him. And I think it's just, you know, 21 year old rookie running backs are incredibly valuable and hard to come by. So whenever I can take a shot on him, I'm, I'm just going to do it every time. Yeah, I was curious to see uh, what you ended up doing one on one. I would end up doing the same thing. I would have taken Taylor there just because I, as well, value the running back position. It's incredibly difficult to kind of replace them on your team if you don't have them, especially like high end end ones. And I, I still think that we're going to see plenty of juice out of Taylor, you know, towards the second half of the season and then going into next year. So Taylor was one on one for me. The, I, I was I was curious as to whether or not you'd go Taylor or pivot to the quarterbacks. And I know we weren't really bought into going with the quarterbacks early on in the super flex. But now that we've seen what they are on the field, like I'm very, very comfortable, which is why I took Joe Burrow at the 102 here. I mean, up, up, up until right now, I think you probably could have made the case for Burrow or, or Herbert, but I'm looking at Joe Burrow. And I think that uh, they build a line around this kid and you're probably, you probably have Aaron Rodgers in his prime for the next, you know, eight to 10 years or whatever. And I was looking at some 16 game paces up to this point in the season, since we're seven weeks in, He's on pace to finish with over 4,600 passing yards, 4,624, which would easily be the most by rookie quarterback of all time. It, it crushes Andrew Luck's record by over like 250 passing yards. Uh, he's on pace for 21 passing touchdowns. He'd be the 13th player ever to throw for 21 or more in his rookie year. His completion rate, third highest ever for a rookie quarterback. Uh, and he's also adding a ton on the ground, man. That's why we, we talked about him a lot this offseason. Like he's a sneaky good athlete, same with Rodgers, where he's probably going to finish with between – 270 and 300 on the ground he's got three rushing touchdowns already the question is like how successful will they be in building an actual offensive line around him man because right now uh he's on pace to get sacked 64 times this year 64 that would be the highest number since fucking david carr back in 2005 and that literally ruined that that sack number basically retired david carr out of the uh out of the nfl but joe burrow handled it 
How many of those sacks came in the Baltimore game? <laughs> like 20 of them? <laughs> At least like 45% <laughs> of them. So Joe Burrow has been able to take those sacks in stride and still succeed, like play through that. It's not in his head. It's not a mental thing. So uh, at this point, Joe Burrow's lived up to every bit of the pre-draft and preseason and summer hype. Um, and I'm sold as, as using him as a cornerstone piece for the remainder of his career. Yeah, and the offense that they're building around him, I know the offensive line is still a little bit sketchy, but the fact that they add Tiddy Higgins, who looks legit, uh, even AJ Green to this point, looks like he's kind of his old self getting like 15 targets and turning into 70 yards, which is whatever. Tyler Boyd's looking good out there. Joe Mix, when he comes back from injury, he's going to be a big part of this, this offense. All they're really missing, I guess, is a tight end, which doesn't really matter all that much in that offensive line. But it's good to see that they did invest in a guy like Jonah Williams and Billy Price a few years ago. That defense always stinks. They're in a competitive division. They're going to be throwing. Joe Burrow is going to be a beast. His floor is like Carson Wentz. His ceiling is like Aaron Rodgers, as Nick said. Maybe not real-life talent, but for fantasy purposes, he can add something on the ground. He throws the ball a hell of a lot. So I'm fine with that, the 102. But I felt a little disrespected. And maybe it was because you guys wanted me to take him at the 103. <laughs> I wrote Justin Herbert. Nick very quickly erased it and turned it to the Herbinator. And I took out the ATE. That was, that was a compliment, the Herbinator. No one, no, one, no one gets a nickname that cool unless I respect them. Yeah. Dude, I, couldn't, I, I couldn't believe you took a tight end at 103, but it totally makes sense. Given yeah, a little weird considering the, t- <laughs> the tweet thread that I put out the other day, how I'm not going to go up and grab a tight end earlier on in, in drafts, and then you come out here and, and you disrespect the godfather. This is, this is so disrespectful. You guys should see, like, the spreadsheet we have. The tight end list, the number one is just LOL. Like, that's how little <laughs> tight ends are, and they're shitting on Herbert at the 103. But to be honest, to this point, this guy's been fucking incredible. I still remember looking at my TV like this four months ago and about to cry because they took Justin Herbert. The volume was off. I read Goodell's lips, and I just went into a sunken place. <laughs> the fact that he went out there and he's like thrown 50 – or he has 15 touchdowns over his past three games uh, – or 15 touchdowns to this point this season and 11 over his past three games. He's just looked incredible. They've completely handed the keys – uh, over to him in this offense, despite Tyrod Taylor seemingly like being their franchise quarterback in the early part of the season. One punctured lung, that's all it took for Justin Herbert to take over and become an animal. He's running the ball a lot. Uh, I guess that's a little bit because of their offensive line being in shambles and not having a good running game because they have Josh Kelly back there who's not a good running back. But what we've seen out of him is he's just a very versatile type of quarterback that can throw the ball deep to Jalen Guyton, who I've never heard of him in my entire life, or he can just pound it up the middle for like 60 yards. So to me, he's like a he's a Josh Allen type who is transitioning to the NFL a lot more seamlessly than Josh Allen did. Uh, he's got a pretty good stable of weapons around him with Hunter Henry, Austin Eckler when he's back from injury, uh, Keenan Allen who just it's got low locked key up. like the Bengals too, where it's like they have a really nice yep. supporting cast. They need to tighten some of the the bolts. No pun intended. There, they get the O line fixed up a little bit. But Herb's been fucking lights out, man. He's looked really, really good, and I like what they're building there in uh, in LA. Yeah. He's been outstanding. I mean, I'm would you have taken him at the 102? What would you guys have done there, Burrow or Herbert? Uh, so I'm I'm a little bit different. I still would have gone CH at 102, but like okay. I have no no quarrels with you're a fucking idiot, Burrow. Noah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I actually no, moved Herbert one spot ahead of Burrow, so they're like back to back for right. me in my rankings. Yeah, I I, I prefer. For Burrow, a tad, but I think this year, like Herbert's going to produce him. He just has a way, he's a way better situation. Um, but what I will say is, like, you know, I tweeted this today. Like, Herbert was the single greatest miss that I've ever had in my fantasy. Like, I was so, so wrong about him. And I just like looking back to some of our videos. And I remember, like, the only reason why I have him is because, like, I refused to let a quarterback with that much draft capital fall out of the top 10 picks. So, like, every time he fell there, I would just grab him. But, like, I think, you know, I really latched on to, like, him, like, basically the biggest critique was like he couldn't handle pressure right in college like whenever he got whenever he had pressure like he was basically folding like a chair and in the nfl that that has not been the case at all and for whatever reason he's been able to like step up in the pocket and stuff like that so it's been it's been great to be proven wrong and just see him and i'm paying the price um by investing in the nfl cards because i don't have him on much dynasty so that's kind of how i'm getting exposure to herbert but yeah he's been he's been incredible he's in historic like historic pace for his first like for his first six games he's like top i think like top five like all time in terms of like his efficiency like you know adjusted uh yards per attempt like yards output like everything he's just like slamming i think him by himself has extended keenan allen by like at least another like couple years as a wide receiver one like a true wide any receiver. chargers the game is ridiculous yeah, yeah keenan allen's gonna i moved him i was redoing my dynasty rankings today a little bit after last week and 
Keenan Allen might have moved up like 30 spots. Yeah. And he was only, he was like 27 before. So you could do the fucking math on that. <laughs> Keenan Allen, huge riser at this. Herbert has literally brought life back into him. I, I, it's so disappointing knowing what Austin Eckler would have oh been my this God. year. Yeah. Dude, like he would have probably been a top five fantasy running back right now had he not got hurt. 100% would have been back. top five. Uh, Mr., Mr. God, you are up at the 104. Yeah, speaking of guys that catch passes out of the backfield but don't actually catch passes, we've got Clyde Edwards Hilaire, the man that cannot <laughs> find the end zone. Um, Mike would have taken him at the 102, as we just discovered. He's an idiot for doing that. But at the 104, that's a pretty <laughs> good value because anytime you're tied to the Chiefs offense, even if you're fucking Daryl Williams, if you're the starting running back, or Spencer Ware, or whatever bum you put back there, you're going to put up fantasy points. And now he's in a time split this year. So his rookie year, uh, it's, it's kind of up in the air. But you got to remember, he was a first-round pick. They get that fifth-year option on him. He's probably going to try to hold out. But even then, if they do keep him for five years, you're getting four years after Bell's gone, four years of probably elite production out of a guy that can catch passes out of the backfield and probably won't be as unlucky with his touchdowns as he has been to this point so far. I mean, two weeks ago, he had like 26 carries for 170 yards. Week one, he looked incredible. It's only the touchdown or the touchdowns that are missing. And I think a lot of it is just because every touchdown that they score is like 50, 60, 70 yards out. He's not getting as many opportunities as we would hope uh, inside the red zone, inside the 10, inside the five. So he's just somebody that when you're attached to Patrick Mahomes, when you're attached to an offense led by Andy Reid and you have the talent that the, he has in a full three down skill set, hopefully he becomes a better blocker. Um, not that he's a no miss prospect, but at this point, he's he's easily a top twelve, top ten dynasty running back for me. I wonder if Bell considers a, a lowered, um, lowered money extension with the Chiefs. I wonder if he's like, I don't want to do this whole free agency thing again. I don't trust my agents to do something dumb again. Like, let's just take a, a two. He probably year, doesn't need that much money. Twelve though, like million for his album sales. You can just take it like. <laughs> That's a good point. Take the whole time. I think it time. depends. It depends. Like, I think if they go ahead and they win a Super Bowl this year, I, I would bet like Bell like tries to cash in again, right? Because then he has like that Super Bowl on his radar and like the second Super Bowl. And like, I think it's, it'll be less important. But let's say like they make it to like the Super Bowl and they lose and they're like that close. I think if he, once he gets a taste of that, he'll probably be more willing to, to kind of like stay there. I think I, it I'll, really depends on what happens there. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. That's why I, I think there are. Like, you love the situation, and Clyde's look great in, in, you know, different pockets of this year so far. But there are a little bit more hesitation towards, like, investing in him now than, than there was at the beginning of the year as soon as um, – what's his name? Opted out. Damian Williams. I'd be, he'll, he'll probably be back next year too, so that could add another little question mark into the mix. I guess, like, you know, with Clyde, it's, it's such a big factor of what he does for this rookie year that will, will factor into Dynasty, uh, like, where you would rank him right now. That's why I took DeAndre Swift at 105. And to be honest, if I was at the 104, I might have taken Swift over it because rest of season, I don't think I can confidently say Clyde outs outscores Swift because the way things are going right now, it feels like we are, we're so close to seeing them just, like, hand over the keys to Swift. He's slowly getting more snaps each week. He's slowly getting more touches uh, and groundwork, and he's looking good doing that. Right now he's, like, quietly the running back 21 on the year. So almost a top 20 running back. Carry on has been completely phased out of the offense. And, like, whereas Clyde can't score, Swift can't fucking stop scoring. He's got five touchdowns on the year already. So he is becoming, like, basically every part of the offense we wanted. All the pass catching work. Uh, he's on pace for almost 55 receptions this year. He's getting the majority of the goal line work, too. He's out um, He's out carried AP 5-2 to two on the goal line. Um, and, I mean, I mean, like, there's only so long that – Matt Patricia and his like malnutrition brain can fucking um, continue giving Adrian Peterson carries that go over half the yard. So like eventually he's going to be phased out. And I think we're slowly starting to see it more and more. Um, so I think, I think rest of season, we're probably going to see like a top 15 running back out of, out of Swift right now. And I think by next year, obviously he becomes a guy in that backfield. Hopefully Patricia's gone. Nick, what's that video? The unforgivable video that dude, the McChicken sandwich. That's how unforgivable. Yeah. <laughs> That's how That's Matt what? is using Swift. It's very unforgivable. It's really waffle fries for it's, free. It is fucking unforgivable. It's ridiculous. Adrian Peterson goes out there. It's like Swift. It, it Swift breaks off forty-two yard run. Next three runs are Adrian Peterson, like two yards, two yards, four yards. It's like, what are you? What game are you fucking watching? You're literally five feet away from DeAndre Swift when you get to watch him run on the field, but you'd rather put AP back out there. So it drives me crazy. But I think we're starting to see the signs, right? At least he has been the leading snap guy there for two or three straight weeks now. He's getting all the touches now, too. So we're slowly starting to creep that up and up and up. And he's breaking big plays and shit. And that's what we saw from him at Georgia. So never a question of the talent. It was always that committee. And uh, I think we're, like, on the precipice of that Miles Sanders-type second half. 
And I think it's important to keep in mind that, like, week one, they had that game in hand. He dropped the pass to, to win the game. And then, like, the next few weeks, he was kind of seeing a lower snap share. He wasn't getting on the field the as much. House. They come out of the bye, mm-hmm. and now he gets a huge – not a huge snap share, but definitely an improvement, getting a lot more usage. He's very explosive. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. He's definitely talented. I think uh, – you're right, Nick. As the year goes on, it's only going to go up from here, and he could have that Miles Sanders breakout. And if he takes that into next year and Karen Johnson isn't on the team, I'm not sure what his contract situation is. I don't think it really matters. And he does eventually become a workhorse. And you can definitely argue for him to be not even a top four pick, but probably a top two or three pick. Yeah, I, I like that Swift pick. And, you know, backing up that Swift pick, I'm going to go with my boy here, J.K. Dobbins. Uh, big fan of him all offseason. Haven't really seen the usage. Like, he's been incredibly efficient and explosive on the touches he has had, uh, similar to Swift, but he just hasn't got any touches. And we know now, I think Mark Ingram has a high ankle sprain, right? So he's going to be gone. Um, but he's still going to be sharing the backfield with Gus, the God, the bus. So it's going to be interesting to see how those splits, they're coming off their bye this next week. So we'll be able to see that soon. Um, but I'm still a big buyer of J.K. Dobbins' talent. Uh, I've liked what I've seen from him so far. And, you know, so I kind of went with him there because he's kind of that last that last cusp of the top end running backs. And I agree with you, Nick. Like, I think him and Swift are super close. And in a full PPR format, I'm going to go with Swift as well. Um, even in half PPR, I might still go with Swift, but uh, J.K. Dobbins is kind of right behind him. And then I backed him up with that other pick, uh, which is Tua Tagovailoa. I mean, I had back-to-back picks. I kind of just went bing, bang. But you can make an argument for Tua going ahead of J.K. Dobbins, even potentially ahead of Swift, because, you know, we've all – I don't remember if you guys were, but I've been a big fan of Tua, like, ever since the offseason. So now that he's kind of getting his role into the offense – is is kind of exciting to see. I actually couldn't believe they benched Fitz. Felt really bad for him. Uh, he came out here and said like how heavy his heart was because they were. I mean, he was pretty playing pretty good ball, right? Like some of the best of his career. But Dude, he think- looks so fucking good. It was such a odd time. I, I mean, I guess the buy was there, so it made a little bit of sense. But I don't know. I feel I think like Tua's just ready. I think what this says is like Tua is ready, yeah. and like we need to see if this is our guy. Um, which which is really really cool for Tua. I mean. People are, I mean, people got mad at Tua. I was like, what the fuck, man? Like, probably also because they believe in their team. They probably didn't want yeah. to throw Tua out there if it, if they were like 1-5, and five, borderline 0-6, and, and just getting fucking pounded yeah. by every defensive line. So at this point, you know, Fitz has played well, but they're 3-3, three and three, and it's not like Fitz is the team of the future. He's not really going to carry them anywhere this year. Yeah. So you're right. It was definitely time with Tua. Yeah, it, it, it was time for him. And I think, you know, more importantly here, I've, I've covered this before, but the reason why I'm comfortable taking Tua is – I really, really like what the Dolphins have done with their org, right? Like the way they built it. Brian Flores is a coach. The, the first – seems like the first coach from the Belichick tree that isn't total fucking trash. Um, he's been solid. Like basically took that losing culture and turned it around within one year. They've invested in the O-line. Like the O-line is nowhere near how bad it was like last year, right? And then they have – you know, they have some weapons in Parker, Preston Williams – I just, I really, really like how this team is being built. And like a lot of people think they're going to draft the running back next year. And like, just like how everyone thought they're going to take Swift this year, I'm not so sure because Miles Gaskins have been playing pretty damn good. And they still need to fill all their pieces. Like, can you imagine if Tua gets fucking Jalen Waddle next year on the Miami Dolphins? You know, this oh, is going to be. I'm sorry, but Darnell Mooney just continues to get overthrown on deep passes. Dude, I can't watch. I can't watch. Over I can't watch. And over I can't, and over I can't watch Darnell Mooney get overthrown anymore, man. It's They're the too only painful. team without a 40 yard pass play this season. Darnell Mooney should be leading the NFL in 40 yard <laughs> pass plays. I, I just can't do it. 40 yard play? They've, they're yet to have one, it says. Oh, I was talking about the Jets. I'm surprised they even have 40 yards. I can't do it anymore. Oh, I think James, remember Jameson Crowder busted yeah, off like a fucking a <laughs> Adrian Peterson type fucking play. It was ridiculous. <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. So two of there makes a lot of sense. I'm like, I'm so curious to see, are all three of these top quarterbacks going to hit? Cause like Burrow and Herbert have hit beyond our imaginations. And now, you know, typically we see a lot of early quarterback busts because quarterback, the value of the position pushes them up NFL draft boards usually pushes them above their talent level sometimes, right? So that tends to be the case a lot. But I guess two of the only reason he even dropped was probably because of the whole, you know, hip surgery, obviously. Um, so I'm excited to see him get on the field, and I think he's going to be a stud as well. So three stud quarterbacks right here. That's when you start investing in the 2020 rookie football cards box. Oh, baby. baby. Oh, um, baby. Yeah, so we're at the 108 right now. So far we've had Jonathan Taylor, Joe Burrow, Herbin Nader, Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, DeAndre Swift, J.K. Dobbins, Tua. And I'm at the 108. I'm going with C.D. Lamb. Now, had C.D. Lamb still had Dak Prescott there, I think you could probably argue him like 
I don't even know if there's a point in which I would tell you to stop arguing. Probably, <laughs> yeah. probably realistically after the two quarterbacks, maybe like a 103, 104 in that range. But yeah, if you wanted to take him where those other running backs were, I wouldn't really have a problem with it. He was ball in the – it took him like 11 seconds to surpass Michael Gallup. Like legitimately <laughs> like no time. And he was a wide receiver two out there. And um, he was a wide receiver one. He was a wide receiver 10. Yeah. Like he, <laughs> with so, so fucking good. And he made, he made Gallup an afterthought. And regardless of what the quarterback situation is right now, like we saw what CD Lamb is in the NFL. He had, prior to this game against Washington, he had five catchers or more in every single game. He was on pace yeah. for 96 receptions, which is absolutely unheard of for uh, a rookie wide receiver. So the remainder of the year, obviously, they're going to be ups, ups and downs because we don't know who's going to be at quarterback, Andy Dolan or fucking Benny DiNucci over there. And it's going to get a little fucking messy. But I expect Dak to be fine next year. Um, and regardless, I think he'll be fine for the rest of the year. Not, you know, the wide receiver one or two that he had been up to this point. But um, I think running 95% out of the slot means that he'll still get easy targets from these quarterbacks. Um, but Dak should be fine next year. And CD should be fucking back. And um, I'm curious to see if anything happens at the trade deadline with Michael Gallup, actually. The trade deadline is yeah. next, um, next Tuesday, November 3rd, I believe. Also election day. Make sure you get your asses out and vote this year, people. I want to know if teams like Green Bay come calling for Michael Gallup, teams like that. Um, that would be interesting. I haven't heard any rumors or reports or anything, but if they're just going to kind of, you know, I doubt they're like tanking on the season just because it's a fucking NFC East at this point, and you could probably get in with a losing record. But who knows, man? I'm, 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 all, I'm all in on, on CD. We saw what we needed to see, and we know who he is. Yep. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, some, you go, Mike. I, I was just going to say, like, I mean, I launched that video, like, probably after week when I did it for Mark Watch Money, it was like week three, week four. I was like, yeah, CeeDee Lamb is no longer on the trade block for any of my teams because I've, I've seen enough. Like the reason why I was so comfortable is like, look, he had that great profile coming in. He had the film coming in. He had everything, right? And then he lived up and exceeded all of those expectations. Like I talked about this a little bit with T. Higgins. I talked about it a little bit with others. But like we very rarely get any insight into the mentality of a player, right? So when I can see guys that are – hyped at every stage of their career consistently de uh, over deliver i think that that gives you some insight into the psyche and the mental makeup of some of these players that's why i love t higgins that's why i love cd lamb it's just been it's been crazy this has been one of the best well, like, I this, love this class F god what <laughs> why i love that god <laughs> been hyped up his whole career oh, yeah. keeps <laughs> over delivering <laughs> the kid just keeps stepping the game up it's the man bun it's the headband it's now it's the beard like it just yeah. doesn't stop There's nothing baby. going on in my chin don't even worry about it <laughs> i love yeah. it yeah it's, it, i agree with you man like if, if had dak not gone down i would have a hard time not taking him like in the top four or top five mm-hmm yeah, and somebody who didn't hype wasn't hyped at every part of their career yet blew everybody's faces off. We got Justin Jefferson, like a famously touted two-star recruit, goes to LSU, is an absolute animal, gets pushed into the slot by what's buddy's name at LSU right now, Jamar Chase. People are saying he's a bum because that offense was great and everybody around him was just because of Joe Brady. We now see him with a terrible quarterback in Kirk Cousins and just putting up 100 yards like it's his day job. He is basically the discount version of CeeDee Lamb. Um, I guess it's not too much of a discount because he's going one pick after him. But in rookie drafts last year, he was more discounted going in the early second round, whereas Lamb was like the 107, 108 type of pick. He has just greatly outperformed all of my expectations, especially as a rookie. People are making fun of them for trading away Stephon Diggs for this pick because Stephon Diggs is great. Turns out Justin Jefferson is almost as good as him and like four years younger. Um, he, he's basically what CeeDee Lamb is. He's, he can win deep down the field. He can win after the catch and he is playing on the outside which is something that a lot of people thought he couldn't do because he played the slot his last year at LSU turns out he can play on the outside and if they do bring in somebody that's gonna play the outside he can go back to the inside and dominate so he's just somebody that is tied to an offense that at least this year is enough to throw the ball a whole hell of a lot because their defense stinks I know that they paid Dalvin Cook and they extended him so he's gonna be around there for a long time but he was also there this year and he's still been breaking out so I just think as the years go on we're going to see Justin Jefferson slowly overtake Adam Thielen as the number one in that offense, as he kind of already has already. Um, he's just he's seeing a ton of targets. It's a consolidated target share on a low volume offense, which I'm fine with because we've saw guys like Doug Baldwin and Tyler Lockett do it in the past in offenses that didn't want to throw a lot. But when you're seeing eight nine targets, it doesn't really matter how many how many times the team overall throws. So I'm completely fine taking Justin Jefferson at the 109 here, just because he does seem like 
a top 10, top maybe even eight dynasty receiver. I think I moved him inside my top 10 this past week, even though that they, they didn't play. I just think it's too much to pass up on given his age and his production at this point. Wait, he's yeah. a top 10 dynasty receiver for you? For me, yeah. Yeah, yeah he is damn. for me. He's, he's back-to-back with C.D. Lamb for me. How does he go to 109 and fucking – wherever you get him in a rookie draft right now is just, like, too valuable. It makes no yeah. fucking sense. I mean, this class is just stacked, right? Like, yeah. like look at – just look at the – look at the people we've chosen. Like, there's, just like, nothing wrong with anyone we've chosen. It's just that – it's just like, this is one of the best classes ever. This next pick is so bad, though. Yeah, one of the best classes ever. <laughs> a guy that didn't even get drafted. We got James <laughs> Robinson, the 110. I Thank know the God. Jaguars, the Jaguars are a complete shit show. But one thing that they can do is pick up guys off of free agency and turn them into animals. They got like Alan Lazard off of undrafted free agency. They cut him. He went to Green Bay and now he's an animal. Keelan Cole's a beast. He was an undrafted free agent as well. James Robinson is every bit of a workhorse running back that you could imagine he is exactly what Leonard Fournette was last year except Leonard Fournette stunk and this guy's actually good uh, he just absolutely annihilated the charges they still won the game so I'm all right all right with it he's like a top two or three running back on the season right now and I see no reason for them to invest in the running back position anytime soon they're gonna have a top two or three pick this year they're obviously not taking a running back there maybe at the top of the second they want to fiddle their whatever and pick up uh Travis Etienne or Najee Harris I just don't see it there's no reason to invest that highly in a position that doesn't matter that much when you can get a guy like James Robinson for extremely cheap have him for four years extend him cheap um, and we've seen like Divino Zigbo came back this week didn't play any snaps Chris Thompson who Jay Gruden loves doesn't even get on the field I know he's on the COVID list but early in the year he wasn't out there um, obviously Raquel Armstead has had some like health complications but James Robinson is just a guy who has been playing like 60 70 and now like 90 percent of the snaps for this offense all around skill set and I know it's a little bit crazy to pick him at the 110 but honestly like if he was picked on in like the third round and he had the production that he has right now he could be talked as like a top four pick it's just the draft capital that's keeping him a little bit more undervalued in my opinion yeah, yeah. this this first round is getting crazy because I'm, I'm taking Antonio Gibson at 111 and in like most drafts if he was in the draft with like Miles Sanders and Josh Jacobs, he probably would have been in that discussion with them. And you're getting him down at 111. I feel like, you know, going into the year, this is kind of how I expected him to be. And I think he's actually getting more work than I expected him to. He's like already, he's, yeah, he's already gotten into the, into the workload of what I thought like his sophomore or junior year would be. And he's coming off this 20 carry game. It was the first time he's gotten like a real significant number of carries. We're obviously seeing like JD McKissick take a little more passing work than we'd like to see because he's such a good athlete. But they're, you know, they're, they clearly love this kid. They clearly think he's the future of their backfield. And they're giving him more and more each week. And they're going to continue, like, to develop him. You hear Ron Rivera come out all the – he continues to come out and say, like, he was a wide receiver at Memphis. We're letting him learn to be a running back, you know, over and over again. So this shit is going to come in time. But they clearly see him as the, as the future of that backfield. And you're about to get a dude whose athleticism matches, you know, the, the comps all offseason were like Joe Mixon, David Johnson. Like, when you put him in, in the combine-type area, he's as good as anybody. And now you're getting the workload. Like, that will eventually pour into a ton of production. We're already seeing it as rookie year. Again, inconsistent, kind of a roller coaster year, but like the upside of what he brings to the table is uh, is huge. So Gibson at 111, I thought was an easy pick. Yeah, and we're recording this after week seven. They go into their bye this week. I think like DeAndre Swift, we might just see a complete change in the guard and they might hand over the keys of the backfield to him just because I know this past week they played Dallas and literally anybody can rip off Dallas. I mean, Deon Darius Johnson was like mahi-mahi fishing. He came into the, the fold and he put up like 95 yards against them. I think that honestly, though, they're playing like the, the Giants coming out of the bye and then I think like Detroit and then Dallas again. Why not just keep feeding them 15 to 20 touches a game because he can obviously turn a few of those into 40 and 50 yard gains. He's getting the goal line work. He's a good receiver out of the backfield. I think going forward, as he does establish himself in the one, as the one in this backfield, he's going to be a big value even at the 111. It's just such a stacked class. You can't really take him much higher than this. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I mean, uh, what is there to say about James Robinson that I haven't said already? I mean, people – People are like, you know, go back and forth on Twitter, and they're like, oh, I want to, I want to wait and see what like hey, the of Zigbo does. What? He hates Antonio <laughs> Gibson about, that much. Talking about Antonio Gibson, you cunt. Yeah, but I want to go back to James Robinson because you guys you didn't, don't, let me, didn't let me talk about no, him. No, I know what the issue is. He doesn't want to talk about T. Higgins. <laughs> uh, I get it. I wouldn't either. Yeah, I just want to say, look, James Robinson's been a stud. If you guys acquired him, great job. Uh, you know, hopefully you weren't one of those people that rushed to sell him for like a second round pick or some shit like that because that, that's all dumb. But yeah, Gibson, look, we we said Gibson was our what like RB RB six or basically after the big five we had Antonio Gibson right and back then like he was going for like a third round pick and 
you know, he landed in Washington. We didn't love it. Noah and I liked it a little bit more than Nick did, but it's it's totally worked out in his favor. Honestly, he's accelerated um, way faster than I thought he would be, uh, like in terms of his role, which is crazy because people keep telling me he's only had 33 carries in Memphis. I'm not sure how that's possible, but he's, he's managed to do that and, and increase his carry count what was, while he's in the NFL. I, I don't even – I forget at this point. Was Geis on the team still when he was drafted or not yet? Or was yeah, he was. gone? No, he was. He was. Okay, that's, prob- was yeah, that's probably why. I, for- I like yeah, yeah. forgot Geis was like in the fucking league. Remember, like, Geis was there, and then, like, that shit came out, and then, like, everyone's like, oh, shit, we're going to move Gibson up to, like, basically where Geis was. That's, yeah, yeah, that was okay, kind of the okay. thought process. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, dude, these both guys, if you invest in them, smash. Like, you know, Gibson, we told you to smash him in like the late second, early third. He was readily available. And now, you know, first round pick. So you, if you want to, if you're a rebuilder, you want to like cash out, like go for it. Like how high, pick. how high is Gibson going to be picked next year in startup drafts? Like, I can't imagine he's going to fall out of the third round in like any of them. I mean, he's not going to go later than, like, at least where David Montgomery went this year, right? David Montgomery is like a fifth round. Well, it depends pick, if Brett's so. in your draft because that's third round. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I, he's going to go way higher than DeMont. Cause he, that's what I mean. like his floor. Yeah, I, I think he'll go uh, – yeah. I would say, like, end of the third round. So, I'm like, if you're getting him at the back end of a rookie draft right now and you know he's going to be a startup, like, fucking um, third round pick, I'm, I'm all in on that. So, you know what, Mike? Lead us to the promised land of the titties. Welcome – to the land of the free, home of the brave, headquarters, sucker of the titties, of <laughs> Titty Higgins. Uh, I mean, I had to deal with these hooligans, <laughs> fucking disrespecting my man Titty Higgins all off season, talking about how he's not good. But we had to hold strong, and this is why, man. Titty Higgins has been balling out. He is already the wide receiver one on the team. Nobody expected that. Not even me. I thought he's going like, to take some time, sit behind AJ Green, sit behind Tyler Boyd, but. He's like, nah, fuck that. Like, I'm commanding the targets, like, right now. And he has looked, he has looked really good. Uh, that's the way I could put it. Like, he's had 20% target share. Um, honestly, like, I don't think the gap between Higgins, Jefferson, and CeeDee Lamb is really that wide at all, especially because if we're looking at the quarterback situation, like, he's tied to Joe Burrow. Um, and I, dude, I, I, honestly, honestly, like, if, if I can get a I stack, believe, I believe that you believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the way. Man, that would take CEH yeah. at 102. <laughs> Look, these guys are going to keep disrespecting Titty Higgins. They're just not going to learn their lesson. So we'll, Also, we'll, behind I'm the a, scenes, I'll slowly keep moving them up my dynasty I'm going to let you guys learn. I'm going to let you guys learn. And when you guys catch up to me, let me know. But Higgins has balled out. And I just love the fact that he's attached to Joe Burrow. And that's going to be a high-passing offense. Their defense stinks. It's going to be high-passing this year. He's going to get a ton of volume this year. And he just he just looks good as the true alpha. Um, like I think it's really rare, right? Like With someone like CeeDee Lamb, you know, people harp on him on this. I don't really – care that much because i don't care how you score fantasy points but he's primarily running out of the slot right versus someone like jefferson and t higgins they've like basically they're the wide receiver ones and they're already taking on the top end cornerbacks uh, most of the time so i think that's really impressive to do as a rookie um in terms of like dynasty like i think i don't know exactly where he is but he's probably like in like top 15 or something like that already um in terms of where he's ranked so yeah look i don't know where you guys are drafting him uh i just know that it's probably too late that's that's probably where I would have taken him. I would have debated. I, th- I think that the two picks you made here were probably the the right picks. I might have went with. I, I think I actually would take Higgins over over Acres. Your next pick, but that's yeah. that's the first round so far. So we got. Uh, I think Jay-Z. Sean McVay would take Higgins over Acres too. <laughs> <laughs> Sean McVay would take a fucking ham sandwich over Cam Makers right now. J T. Joe Burrow, Herb, Clyde, Swift, Dobbins, Tua, C D. Justin Jefferson, James Robinson, Antonio Gibson, T. Higgins. If we had to redo it all over again, that is the first round seven weeks into the season. So the biggest riser is obviously James Robinson. I think he was pretty wildly undrafted throughout most of the uh, yeah. throughout most of the rookie drafts. And then uh, who's like the biggest? I guess we, we can go with like Faller when we get to yeah. the My other pick, ones. Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's start. Yeah, I'd say. I mean, I'd say one of the biggest followers is the one that I'm taking right now, and it's Cam Akers. And I, I, to be frank with you, I made this pick before this game, uh, before his retirement party. But uh, <laughs> he's not basically not being used. I mean, he's getting outplayed by Darrell Henderson, who uh, most of us wrote off, including myself. He's getting out snapped by Malcolm Brown. So things are not looking good at all for Cam Akers. There's, there's really no positives other than the fact that before he got injured, he's looking like he was getting more of a role. And the fact that the Rams – O-line actually looks a lot better than all of us thought it would be. So I think those are the only positives. But in terms of usage, man, like nothing is there. But why am I taking them here after all that? It's like it's still only half a season, right? I mean, we got to remember like these guys do take time to develop. And 
I said from the jump, like Cam Akers is someone that's going to take time to develop. He is very raw. He played quarterback in high school. And, look, he's, he's on a good offense, a good enough offense. And he's on an offense where they are producing fantasy points at the running back position. I can't imagine Malcolm Brown being there long term. And he's got the draft capital. He's got the athleticism. And I still think he's a, he's a really good player, right? He, you know, the injury kind of set him back a little bit. But I'm, I'm still in on Cam Akers. I'm willing to invest um, in him. And, you know, it took some time for Swift to break out. I think it's going to take some time for Cam Akers to break out. But I do still think he is the best running back in the backfield. Yeah, we'll move on to 202. This seems to be like the little row of, of guys who were drafted really high, and now you're kind of getting them at value because they're – their shit just dropped, whether it's lack of performance or getting hurt or whatever. That's my guy right here, Jalen Rager. And I know all three of us were, you guys probably a little higher on him than I was going into the year. But I mean, not that I disliked him. I still totally believe in the kid's talent. And like, just because he's been injured doesn't mean he has played poorly when he's on the field. You look at like what's going on in Philly right now. Like Djax is done. Djax is probably done for the fucking year. Alshon Jeffrey, they're talking about trading him. He, I feel like he could have been back three weeks ago if they really wanted him back on the field. So he's done, at least in Philly, as far as my mind goes. He's their first-round pick. Like, they want him to be the wide receiver one there. Um, he just got activated off the IR. So I think we do see him get back on the field, like, really quickly. I'm excited to see him get back on the field and kind of get his value back up to where it was pre, uh, pre-regular season and, and kind of pop off the second half of the year as they obviously desperately need weapons outside of Travis Fulgham, who is like a – maybe Travis Fulgham is what we thought Jalen Rager was going to be. Dude, I think, if anything, the fact that you're seeing what Travis Fulgham is doing is pretty illuminating, right, in terms of what Rager's going to do when he's coming back. Like, that offense is picking agree, up a little yeah. bit more. Wentz is not looking like the fucking trash can that he was for the early part of the season. Um, and they are throwing a lot. And, look, Travis fulgham has been good, no doubt about it. But I don't think Travis Fulgham is as good as Jalen Rager. So when Rager comes back, in the couple plays that he did make when he was healthy, he looked fucking outstanding. He was getting looks deep, which is exactly what we want to see. Um, he's physical at the catch point, and he's everything we wanted to be. I mean, I'm going to pass on to Noah because this is your guy. So where where would you have taken him, Noah? I'm actually curious. Mike, you're not going to like this, but he would have went ahead of T. Higgins for me. I just I think that the here, talent here. is still there. The only thing we haven't seen is production, but he's been hurt. I mean, early on, he caught like a 55-yard. No, what happened? And I'm kidding. I actually, like, it's totally fair to, like, flip back and forth between T. Higgins. Like, I actually have them in the same tier, so. Yeah, I mean, he was looking good before he got hurt. Like you said, he was getting pretty good usage. Deshaun Jackson's gone, so he's in a man that deep role. But we also know that he can win after the catch. So I just think that uh, we shouldn't take away anything from his talent just because of his injury. And it looks like he may not be back this week. Um, but if, if, he does after, if he does come back after the bye, they get all in a row. The Giants, the Browns, the Seahawks, the Packers, the Saints, the Cardinals, and the Cowboys. Those are all very either very soft games or games where they're going to have to throw a lot. The wide receiver core and the receiving core as a whole is completely depleted. Maybe Dallas Goddard comes back after the bye. But other than that, it's just Fulgham, it's Goddard, and it is Jalen Rager. So I just think that he's going to probably blow up after the bye. And we're going to see why they drafted him in the first round. I just think he's way too talented to um, to disappoint at the 203 right here, or the 202 right here. Um, whereas the guy at the 203, I know Animal is crying tears about Jerry Judy. This guy... It's kind of a fraud. I mean, people want to make fun of the way his knees bent. Um, more power to him because the way that they're bending right now isn't helping him catch any passes. He's catching like two to three passes a game. His only big game was when he mossed some guy in the Jets. I think it was like Pierre Desir. Other than that, he's just basically West Coast Willie Sneed catching like three passes for 40 yards every game. He is – it's kind of disappointing because he was completely – he was like the 101 for like everybody's rookie drafts heading into the draft. And then they realized, hey, this guy didn't do as well in his junior year as a sophomore year. Let's move him to the 109. So uh, he did have a little bit of a fall from grace. I do think it does have to do with the quarterback situation because Drew Locke is a fucking bum. And we tried to tell you that this offseason. Nobody wanted to listen, whatever. They did put up Britt Rippon. They did have like Brandon I mean, out last I year. Mean, so like, I don't know what's going on. Could, can you blame them? It's, we've been targeting Josh Allen, Justin Herbert. <laughs> that's two two big ass fucking quarterbacks we were wrong on it, w- it would be a nice trifecta if drew lock just shit on our chest as well <laughs> so yeah if you're over 220 pounds we're probably wrong about you but we were also wrong about jerry Judy a little bit who's probably like 180 soaking wet so he's just he's been a disappointment i would still bet on his talent though uh being able to produce in the future but Cortland sutton's gonna be back next year when this offense is probably gonna be a little bit better than it is right now he's probably never gonna be the number one as long as he's there so his upside is capped so um as, as it looks that's right now, point. he's like a perennial wide receiver too on his own offense. I think that's a takeaway, right? Like before the season, the reason why I wasn't as high on Jerry Judy is because I think like Colton Sutton is the dude. Um, but if you think back to it, like, I mean, the, 
my comp, like the biggest comp for the most, sorry, the most favorable comp for Jerry Judy is like Calvin Ridley and not to like be a, be like a helmet scouter, but like they're very similar style of players, just like catch and fall, uh, a great crisp with the routes um, and like smaller in stature. Right. But I think the key takeaway for me here is like, he did, they don't have like an Atlanta passing offense, right? They don't have like Matt Ryan. Yeah. So the way Matt Ryan supports Julio and Ridley, I'm not sure that happens here with Drew Locke, uh, who stinks. And I think, sorry, I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to make all the Drew Locke uh, people mad. He doesn't think he's just bad. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Very considerate but, of you. Yeah. But I think, I think what this says is like, dude, Cortland Sutton is that dude, right? Cause Jerry Jude right now straight up getting played by fucking outplayed by Tim Patrick. There, there's like no two ways about it. And Tim Patrick is really playing that role that Sutton plays. And you see like Drew Locke willing to push it down the field. And that's the guy that's going to get those targets. So I'm, I'm not in the camp of a, buy low on Jerry Judy yet I think if you can get it for cheap for like a you know second round pick then obviously do it which, which is what clearly what we can see here but uh, I'm much I'm much more interested in acquiring uh Cortland Sutton at a discount yeah so I mean second round picks in this draft are like usually first round picks in most years so if you yeah. could if you could push that off like not every year is going to be like this where you're getting a fucking yeah. Jerry Judy at the 203 and getting yeah. a, a Visca a little Visca action next yeah Noah dude take it away man I probably should have taken LaVisca Chenault over Jerry Judy, but I mean, this guy's incredible. Gonna say, you're going to go from like hating a guy to loving a guy, <laughs> but taking him afterwards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know. After the video we made about him, I'm like, he can't be good because everybody I hype up stinks, but he's been everything that we hope for. I mean, at the combine, he like pulled both his hamstrings clean off the bone. Uh, his core was like all torn apart, but it just seems like he's been healthy all season. Uh, his usage has been like a little bit up and down the weeks that you play him thinking he's going to be a wide receiver too. He puts up zero points in the weeks that DJ Chark is supposed to blow up. He puts up like 14 and a half. So uh, he, he's a bit of an enigma, but I do think that the versatility he brings to this offense and the skill set that he's shown just winning after the catch consistently. Uh, he, he's somebody I can't pass on at the two. Oh, I can't do math like two Oh four, two Oh five. Uh, he, he's just somebody that am I, I think- am I the only one? I just have a question because like, Visca makes me – he's looked awesome. Like, he's been fun to watch. But I don't know what his ceiling is in fantasy. And people love to be like, oh, not – like, what you said, versatility is good in, in terms of, like, yeah, because that matters for fantasy. But, like, people would be like, oh, he's so versatile. Like, he's going to take carries. I'm like, dude, I don't care about two carries for six yards. Like, that does nothing for me for fantasy. He's not the goal line back. Like, I don't care if they line him up in wildcat so he can gain seven yards on the ground. Like, that does – you know. So, my, my, my question is, like, what his real – ceiling in fantasy is like I'm someone who owns Visca in multiple places and I'm like I'm kind of at a crossroads whether or not I believe long term that he's going to be like a real you know dynasty fantasy asset what happens be like, a Debo Samuel. like Debo year. Samuel's not in a high powered like passing offense and he gets a few carries which doesn't really lend itself to too many fantasy points but I think what he can do after the catch and even if it's like 50 to 60 catches yeah. on a season he could turn that into like 800 900 yards I feel like that's more like on the coach though like Shanahan's so good at scheming that and I don't fucking trust anything that happens in Jacksonville, football or, or life related, anything in Florida, <laughs> want no part of. Dude, I I I, I love Lewis. Um, and I well, I just love watching him play. First of all, and he looks like a fucking grown man out there. Like people cannot tackle. Like NFL safeties and defensive backs, grown men cannot tackle. Um, and we know look, Jacksonville is not going to be a great team, so they're probably in line for the quarterback. If Justin Fields lands there, great for the stock. Uh, even if one of the other guys, uh even if they one of the other guys and they're still like really, really good for stock. So I'm a buyer of the talent long-term. So I don't really think I'm looking to sell at all. He's got a good profile coming in. He's performed to date. Uh, and he's made Gardner Minshew look a lot better than Gardner Minshew has played. Yeah. Uh, he's had like, life. he's had like plays that are impressive, but I feel like I'm yet to see a game that he like yeah, he hasn't takes over, game. you know, like all these other rookie receivers, like T Higgins has games where he takes over. Like all these guys have had those and I just I don't I don't get the consistency feeling like he'll always have those flash plays and have highlight plays because he's this guy and that's the type of player he is. But like I want to see a couple games down the second half of the year where it's like okay you know he went like eight for one twelve and a touchdown broke like three big plays you know what I mean like I, I want I want to see a full game of consistency from this guy yeah, yeah. in that sense. No, for sure that that totally makes sense. Um, yeah, we need some some more consistencies from my boy here at two hundred five as well. It's Henry Ruggs, and this was my worst nightmare them using him that the way the way that they are using him and I debated this was probably one of the tougher picks and looking at the board now I probably would have taken Claypool over Ruggs here if I can go back and do it again I want you guys to guess 
What percentage of Henry Ruggs' targets this year are deep targets? He's second in the NFL. What percentage? It's 50%. So 50% of his passes this year have been deep targets. And I'm like, fuck, like that's not what – that's not the way they should be using him. Like he's a really really good good player. He's a quarterback. (laughs) <laughs> Dude, Derek Carr's been a fucking beast this year. Honestly, it should equate to more points for Henry Ruggs. But, he's, I mean, he's been good and limited. He, he was really hot to start the year, and then he got hurt, and then he came back. He had the big game last week, but it was on, like, two catches, you know, and those were deep downfield targets. So, like, what I'll be keeping a really close eye on when it comes to Ruggs is how they deploy him over the second half of the year. Because right now, Noah, you, uh, everyone out there that owns Aguilar can thank you for mushing him into score after score after score after score. But if Henry Ruggs just keep being – it keeps continues to be like this downfield Hail Mary guy. I'm going to be nervous about rugs. Like I want them to use him in slants. I want them to use him in the screen game because that's where his explosiveness comes from. So, I mean, listen, he is a rookie. He's shadowed by all these other rookies who are going crazy right now. And I think in a normal year, we'd be like, okay, rugs actually, you know, he's doing fine. He's dealt with some injuries and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the usage is something I'll keep my eye on for sure. Second half. Of the yeah. He, he's honestly, I think he's been pretty impressive. And I, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, but I, I do think, like, the struggle is, like, the Darren Waller. Like, Darren Waller is just too fucking good to keep off the field. And, like, Darren Waller is getting all the underneath, like, all the crossers. And I just, I just don't see that changing. Like, he is a top – he's, he's like, one of the best tight ends in the league. And he's just incredible as a pass catcher. So, I think that's where Henry Ruggs will struggle a bit. And they still use Hunter Renfro as well, like, in that area. So, like, they need someone to fill that deep threat. And he's, like, doing his job, right? Like he's playing good football. He's making the most out of the opportunities he's getting. He's making some fucking incredible catches. But I agree with you for fantasy-wise. Like, it's going to be – it's tough to, like, to like really trust him. And I honestly – I think they're going to give Waller, like, like a Kelsey-type extension. And they're going to keep him there long term. I could see. I also that. think it's like kind of shitty that guys like C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, A.J. Brown last year, D.K. Metcalf, like they've been so good as rookie receivers that guys like Henry Ruggs who have looked impressive but haven't put up huge numbers are just like we're writing them off already just because they haven't yeah. produced as like all these other guys have. We got to remember in the past like not many first year receivers are doing what a lot of these guys are doing. So I still think Henry Ruggs is definitely talented. He's definitely very fast. Do we need to stop saying that, that though? Is that not is that no longer a thing? Like, can yeah, we expect don't. really good receivers to produce immediately? Because it feels like three so. years. Yeah, I feel like it's three years running. There was like, oh, we don't expect rookie wide to produce like, for these seven guys who did it this year and these seven guys who did it last year. And the seven guys no, are yeah. going to do it next That's year. That's true. You know, I, I think the coming out there and producing already. Yeah, I think mean, that the first the talent nine is for nine hundred just... stat line. <laughs> talent is just too deep at the wide receiver position and like the good players are just going to get on and i think like you see it not only with wide receivers but with quarterbacks as well right if you think back in the day like it was normal for guys to come in and sit but right now it's like if they don't start within like the first five games like people pitchforks are out so that's why you see like justin herbert's out there two was getting in there now joe, joe burrow was on there from day one and i think it's a very similar thing with like wide receivers where like coaches are more willing to let these guys kind of get the snaps and play and if they are really good like like Higgins, like Lamb, all these guys are going to produce. And the 2021 class is one of the another really really talented and deep wide receiver class. So I think I'm like kind of gonna I'm gonna start adjusting to the point where like if these guys are not producing first year, it's gonna be a bit of a red flag for me just seeing the recent trends of like yeah. I mean it's got to be rel- it's got to be relative to what what you can put on the field today. You know, it's relative to like the guys that they're competing against. You can't always look at it back to 2014 or 13. You're not comparing it to those guys because you're picking one or the other. The guys yeah. that are playing today. Speaking of guys that are producing, uh, probably you guys were surprised to see me pick him here, but I went with Chase Claypool, uh, and I think I think this is a pretty good value in the mid second round. Uh, I was a very big advocate against Claypool just because of his profile and stuff like that, but I mean the kid's been balling. It's very clear that he's like being treated as a top you know top three option in, in the Pittsburgh Steelers offense, and this recent week. You know, he put up a goose egg, and I think people are maybe worried now that he's not going to be good going forward. You know, part of that is because Deontay Johnson came back, who was an absolute baller, got hurt again at the end of the game, though. And part of that is, like, they were actually bracketing Claypool and treating him as a wide receiver one. They put they put uh, Malcolm Butler on him and then uh, bracketed him over top of the safety for most of the game, and he didn't put up anything. So, But what he was able to do, like, early on has been incredibly impressive, and it's kind of hard to just ignore that um, and call it a fluke. Yeah, I also don't think Juju's like long for Pittsburgh. It just seems like he's got to go. They don't, they don't 
they're not going to extend him. I think he's a free agent this offseason. I don't think there's a reason to extend him just because Deontay Johnson, when he's on the field, he's the clear-cut alpha. As you said, Mike, Claypool had one down game, but he also had like four touchdowns two weeks before, a touchdown last week. He, he's been running in touchdowns. The fact that he gets tackled at the one and then they have so much faith in him to be able to run it to him on the goal line just because they want to give him those touchdowns just shows that they want him to be a big piece of this offense. So I, I definitely think at the 206 or 7, I, I can't do this math. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Um, I just think that that's a huge steal. And, and I could see you arguing him over a guy like Jerry Judy, LaVisca Chanel, and a bunch of the receivers we already took ahead of him. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 I feel like it's as easy as watching the games at this point. It's like, okay, we were wrong. People were wrong on Claypool. He's just really fucking good at football. He's going to be on the field one way or another, whether it's through personnel or them just forcing him onto yeah. the field. And uh, let's move. Yeah. Back-to-back yeah, back to back with him, another guy who I wasn't bit that high on, uh, it's Brandon Ayuk. Um, you know, I kind of laughed at the notion that people thought Brandon Ayuk was better than Nikhil Harry. Uh, it seems that's the case a few games in already, and we know Debo is kind of out for the next couple of games and get more time to shine. Um, but, yeah, he's, I mean, he's basically like a, like a Debo Carbon. They're using him out of the backfield. They're running him. They're trying to basically get the ball in his hands as much as they can. Um, I actually really debated this pick and, and your next pick, Nick, um, and I ended up going with, with Ayuk. Uh, just because, like, I, I believe in the organization a little bit more. Um, but, but yeah, I think we'll kind of, like, move on to your next pick here, which is kind of interesting, and this, you know, it's one I debated, and it's Denzel Mims. And so why did you why did you go with Denzel Mims here? Uh, Denzel Mims was just a dude that we know is athletically gifted, and uh, it seems like it was, you know, just needed to get him on the field to kind of confirm that he could do it on NFL field. And we only have a, literally a one-week sample size, and it was Brashad Perriman in the concussion protocol and Jameson Crowder not on the field, but he looked good in the first week. And, uh, I mean, you can't hold his athletic profile against him when he's not on the field, right? Missed the first six games. He's a rookie playing in his first game. Commanded over a 30% target share with Sam Darnold this weekend, which is obviously a massive number. Again, very small sample size, but he was always a guy that I was high on, um, and he was a guy that – I would have been targeting very early in the second round, if not like the latish first round, uh, if all my guys were off the board. So to get him out like a six or seven round or six or seven pick um, discount just due to the injury, I'm here for it. Yeah, same thing with the next guy, Brian Edwards. He's somebody who famously broke his foot, didn't get to participate in the combine, and thus far has been injured basically throughout his entire rookie season. He was on the field a lot his the first week that he played, gets injured. He hasn't really done all too much. Mike already touched on it with uh, Darren Waller. Probably going to be there for a long time. Going to be sucking up a lot of the targets that we would hope Brian Edwards would get in the short and intermediate game. Obviously, we expect Henry Ruggs to develop as a player. Nelson Aguilar, for what he's doing right now, I'm not sure that's going to stick around. He, Brian Edwards is just a guy that I know like not everybody loves to look at analytics, but he has like a pristine analytical profile when it comes to his breakout age. College dominator. The fact that he did it with guys like Hayden Hurst and Debo Samuel while he was at South Carolina – um, obviously, we, as we said before, we want to see these guys produce year one, but nothing has really lined up for him to be able to uh, produce year one. So I just, I'm going to believe in the talent here. and I'm going to take him ahead of the running backs who we're about to talk about these 230 pound between the tackles grinders that really don't do much for you when it comes to fantasy. And speaking uh, of, we got fucking Joshua Kelly. Really don't want to talk about him. About say, you, who are you segueing into, into your fucking self? <laughs> like, all right, we're about to talk about it. Oh, wait, it's me? <laughs> oh. I was hoping somebody else would talk about Joshua Kelly because I don't want to talk about this guy. Number Nobody wants to talk about Joshua Kelly. You just keep – dude, you, this entire list is fraudulent. You just keep taking the Chargers. <laughs> That's how good Grow they up. are. Uh, we got Joshua Kelly out of UCLA, hopefully going back to UCLA because I don't want to see him on a pro field. This guy's averaging like two <laughs> yards a carry. He stinks, but when you look at the list after this, like I'd probably rather have him than Zach Hoss Moss, as Nick calls him because he also stinks, but they have Devin Singletary there, who's uh, probably a better pass catcher, also, although like, he's not a good pass stinks. catcher. Everybody stinks. I, I, I yeah. actually I disagree. I disagree. I think I would rather have Zach Moss than, um, than Joshua Kelly. Uh, if I'm you know the honest. video I took... too long when we're arguing Zach Moss and Josh Kelly. <laughs> yeah. I took the Hoss. <laughs> I took the Hoss at 211. This was not a, a positive Zach Moss notation. It was more of the detriment to Devin Singletary at this point. Like yeah. I, this dude, he really, he was so fun to watch his rookie year. And uh, I don't know. I haven't really seen much this year that has looked promising whatsoever for Singletary and Moss missed a few games, came, came back in this week and it's, it's a near 50, 50 time split. So right now, like, I don't know. He look, Moss looked better this week, and I'm sure maybe next week it'll be Singletary again. But 
Um, I don't know. Moss is a guy who's at worst in a 50-50 time split and could eventually take over the uh, the starting role here. And there's just like no one left on the board that I think um, really has any fucking value left. So I was like, I'll go with Moss because Singletary stinks. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. I mean, Singletary is not really in the high leverage such as, I mean, he's the running back three on his own team. Uh, so at least <laughs> Zach Moss is a running back two. Obviously, the RB1 is Josh Allen. You're forgetting um, TJ Yeah, <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Sorry, uh, it's TJ Yeldon. But, yeah, I agree with you. Like, I actually prefer Zach Moss to Josh Kelly because, like, I mean, my, my pre-draft analysis, like, Josh Kelly was, like, the biggest jag ever. He's, like, the quintessential jag. And what he's done so far is exactly that. Like, he takes what's given, uh, probably a little bit less than what's given, nothing more, nothing less. He's, like, he's fine, and he's, like, a plotter, and he's there, and he gets carries, he gets volume. But, like, a lot of his empty volume, you know, if he's not getting a touchdown for you, He's not going to get it done. I think he's been outplayed by Justin Jackson so far, who's, I guess, hurt. So you kind of have to hold him for dynasty purposes. I'm just not – I'm not that interested in Joshua Kelly. In fact, like, I would take even the guy that I took to close out the second round, uh, Kajan Hamler, over Joshua Kelly because I think there's probably with, a bigger chance. With Joshua chance. Kelly, though, like – Next year on a serious note, because Eckler will be back obviously by the end of this year, and then next year Justin Jackson could be gone. Like Kelly could Kelly could play the same exact role next year as he's doing this year, and this offense could be one where if you have the goal line role, like it could be pretty fucking valuable. So I think like as yeah. much as we hate Josh Kelly and we do think he stinks as a running back, I, he's he's probably worth the second round pick right now at at the two eleven. I think he's a, he's like a. In that scenario, he would be like a low volume Jordan Howard, uh, with like a, maybe a couple of targets sprinkled in. But like the, the issue sure. is like his role doesn't change, right? That's why that, that's the mistake that I made. Like I thought right. that his role would be more valuable if Eckler got hurt. Not the case. His role as a two down grinder, plotter, sometimes goal line back is just gonna stay neutral. And once Eckler comes in, like Eckler's just gonna be way better than Justin Jackson, so he'll get. We gotta more stop talking about Eckler. Actually, never mind. I'm it's, so it's sad making, right now. It's I got making to talk me about very depressed <laughs> about like most like, of my. Man, I hate this guy. <laughs> it hurts. It hurts so bad, dude. Ugh. Um, but yeah, let's close out the second round real quick. KJ Hamler, uh, I I kind of you know he's been hurt as well, so a little bit of an injury discount here. This is basically where I would have taken him in normal drafts. He hasn't really moved that much for me. Um, like like I said, like Jerry Judy. Has, is not that, like, generational talent that everyone thought he was. And that's the reason why I wanted to bet on K.J. Hamlin. Like, so, hey, like, what if uh, it played out? And it turns out that Tim Patrick's better than everyone, so it didn't play out exactly as I thought. <laughs> but I do think K.J. Hamler kind of adds that explosive element uh, to the game, and I still think he could be, like, he could have, like, that McCole Hardman uh, type of rise. So I actually really like him here. I think the biggest follower, though, uh, before we close, thing out, close this thing out, is Michael Pittman. He didn't even get drafted by any of us. And, and Keyshawn Vaughn. So depressing. Yeah. So what? Keyshawn, I mean, Keyshawn Vaughn stinks. So whatever. Um, but Michael Pittman, like, why, why did you guys let him fall this far? Because, like, Phillip you know, Rivers. we took a shot on some other injured players, um, but clearly he didn't get the same treatment. I think, you know, early on in the year, like, he was in that first round discussion, right? Like, people were taking has him. He been, has he been out all this time? How long has he been out for? He's been three hurt weeks. for a while. Probably three yeah. or four weeks. Uh, okay. Yeah. I guess, like, going back to the point of it being relative to other people around you or at your position and how they're producing, there've been a lot of guys who have, who have been hurt this year, but when they're on the field, like they've at least produced. And this is, this is tough to do, like make dynasty picks based off of six to seven week sample sizes, right? Cause one good game is going to shoot you up. One drop could yeah. be the difference between, you know, the two Oh two and the, and the two ten or something like that. But it's just like when Pittman was on the field in the beginning of the year and his matchups, like it's fun looking back to at this point because you know how bad <laughs> so defenses bad. are. The first three games were Jacksonville, Minnesota, and the New York Jets, and he so did bad. nothing against them. So it's like, fuck, like that's all we have to work off of. But again, that's all we have to work off of. So it's like he didn't show up there when they didn't really have any other. I guess they had, Par you know, they had Paris Campbell and shit, but they didn't have a lot of passing weapons where he couldn't have broke out and made himself a role there. So I guess that's like the unconscious kind of like pullback on on a guy like Michael Pittman for me. Also, yeah, for me, it's I the quarterback situation. Like, they have Phillip Rivers there. He's not long for Indianapolis. What are they going to do after that? Like, Jacob Eason, maybe Jacoby Brissett. It's just – it's going to be a mess there. I think they're going to be a run-happy offense. Uh, Paris Campbell's probably going to be the number one there, being a target hog out of the slot. And I wasn't too high on Pittman going into the draft and after the draft anyway, so not much has changed. Yeah, that's – Mike, I thought – uh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was going to say, those are the points that I was going to go over. Like, I – we saw what Paris Campbell did. Right, so Paris Campbell is gonna, seems like he's gonna be that guy. One, two, like 
Phillip Rivers fucking stinks. And but the problem is their team isn't bad enough to actually like get a top end draft pick um, at the quarterback position. Like they're probably going to finish like in the bottom half, maybe like the bottom third, uh, based on how their schedule's looking uh, going forward. So that's why like I'm not that high on him. And I wasn't high on him as a prospect anyways. Um, so maybe a little bit of confirmation bias there. But yeah, it's just like the situation that just doesn't really bode well for for someone like him to excel. I was surprised you didn't take uh, Jalen Hurts at the 212. Dude, I thought about wow, that. What a I, fucking I, catch by Robinson. Sorry. Beautiful throw and catch. I, I definitely thought about it, um, taking Jalen Hurts. Um, but, like, you know, there's still, like, I just feel like there's other guys that can kind of have some value. But I definitely, if it was a 301, I would have went back-to-back, though, with Jalen Hurts my next Yeah, knowing, sure. knowing what we know now, I feel like his value would only rise because Wentz kind of confirmed what a lot of people thought, that he was kind of on the hot seat for a while. But, again, like, so hard to know what the real common denominator is with Wentz and Philly. Is it like him, him? I mean, objectively he he's made a bunch of horror throws and he's looked terrible at times, but also he's like willed this team to a bunch of victories back to back while they're fucking completely dead on the offensive line and their weapons and stuff. So it's, it's hard to get a read on it, but um, I, I still don't see Jalen Hurst starting any games this year, but, um, but he, he's right there. If something does slip up. Yeah, for sure. All right, look, that's all we got for you guys. It's a freaking long ass episode. I'm tired. I'm hungry. Uh, you know, that big dogs out eat, man. So we're gonna head out. Make sure you smash the subscribe button. Even if you don't like us, fucking subscribe. Just do it because eventually you will. <laughs> Show we some will fucking con- respect. Show some respect. We will convert you. I promise you. Uh, make sure you follow Nick. Follow Noah. Follow myself on Twitter. Talk trash. Tweet at Nick about the Atlanta Falcons. He fucking loves that shit. I can't say this enough. You just DM him. Tweet at him. Anytime Falcons news comes out, just do it. He, I know. He hit it. the outro. <laughs> we, we, yeah, we let's, appreciate let's it. This, let's um, go. Make sure you follow our channel, Noah and my channel as well, uh, on Bunk Bed Breakdowns. Follow both of us. We have some exclusive content on there that isn't flooded on Nick's, uh, Nick's main channel just because we don't, you know, there's too much content, too many different streams. So make sure you follow us on there. I know subscribe. you guys can only take so much of Mike's face once a week. <laughs> Is more than enough. All this shit will be linked in the description. Just hit every fucking button on the way down there. Hit it all.